Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome back to Straight Talk Immigration. And uh, today we're actually starting a new segment and it's called uh, Dear Immigration Consultant. And for this segment, uh, my dear friend, uh, who is also um, an RCIC, uh, will join us. And uh, she, will, she will be a part of this, a regular part of this segment. Um, she's uh, Geraldine Alcalde. G, can you please greet our viewers? Hi, everyone. It's yeah. nice to be here. Yes, and uh, for for today, uh, our first episode, we will actually be talking about the unauthorized representatives because there's a lot of them. Uh, they're proliferating, and uh, when, when they're not supposed to, um, you know, represent or give advice to. Um, people who want to migrate to Canada. So it, it is against the law for unauthorized representatives to give advice and um, you know get clients and ask for a fee. So I'm just going to give uh, some examples of this unauthorized representatives and later on, G will share her experiences about um, some clients who had bad experiences with unauthorized representatives. So let me start by, by uh, naming uh, some of these people who shouldn't really charge clients or they shouldn't even have clients, right? Because they're not authorized to, uh, under immigration law. So this would include education advisors or education agents recruitment agencies, um, YouTubers, or social media influencers who successfully immigrated to Canada and are using their experiences as basis to give immigration advice. And some of, the, some of them are actually um, using the, the um, advising as a side hustle, or some of them are using it as their main jobs. And also uh, this would include people who have immigration practitioners diploma, but have not um, registered with the immigration, um, with the ICCRC. So they are not supposed to give immigration advice as well, uh, just because they have uh, diplomas uh, for immigration uh, practice programs, uh, they're not supposed to give immigration advice and they're not supposed to charge, to charge people. And lastly, uh, there are also uh, settlement workers who go beyond assisting their clients on where to find uh, immigration information on the websites. So this, um, these individuals uh, are not supposed to charge people uh, or give advice for a fee. They are prohibited by uh, the law. Uh, so right now I'm going to turn over the discussion to G, who will share with us her experiences with unauthorized representatives. Okay, thank you, Dad. So for uh, education of our viewers, I will discuss with you uh, two, actually there's two particular cases. These are different uh, cases. Uh, that had been, um, well, jeopardized by unauthorized representations. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I think we will start with one case, which is the yeah. caregiver in Canada. Mm -hmm. So for confidentiality reasons and in consonance with the privacy law of Canada, I will not be stating the 
identity of this uh, applicant. I will be discussing uh, some circumstances, but not the details. Mm -hmm. Okay. To comply with the laws of Canada. And of course, with the ICCRC, confidentiality reasons, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, this applicant came to Canada under the Live-In Caregiver Program in 2014. So due to unavoidable circumstances, she was not able to complete her 24 months of work in the four years preceding her first application. Although the four years limit had already been lifted by that time, but the policy still stands that the two years work experience must be completed in the last four years preceding the PR application. So she sought the advice of a representative, which probably she thought uh, mm -hmm. was an authorized representative, but then uh, upon our investigation was unlicensed. Oh, okay. So that an authorized representative proceeded with the application for permanent residence under the live-in caregiver class. Mm -hmm. So as expected, the application was refused because it was it was a uh, staggered um, completion of the 24 months, which, uh, which I mean, um, exceeded the four years preceding the application. Oh, so it was refused. Mm -hmm. The same unauthorized representative told her to submit another application under the new program then that was the Caring for Children class mm -hmm. where she spent additional money for the language test and the Education Credential Assessment or the ECA. Mm -hmm. Well, unfortunately, as expected again, the new application was also refused for the same reason. So she went uh, to the Philippine Overseas Labor Office where a representative of its Canadian nonprofit partner referred her to me. Mm -hmm. So as a remedy, what I did during the time was uh, to get her a new work permit. It was backed by a positive labor market impact assessment or LMIA mm -hmm. under a new employer. So she could continue to stay in Canada with a valid status. Then I advised her to complete anew the 24 months work experience. But before completing the two years work experience, she came to me with the interim caregiver program, you know, prospect of applying for PR again. Oh, okay. I advised her that she's not qualified because her entry to Canada was under the live-in caregiver program and her mm -hmm. work permit clearly states that she is in the LICP category. Mm -hmm. So, however, she sought the help of the settlement center. So she went to the settlement center. She didn't go back anymore to that unauthorized yeah. representative. So she uh, went to the settlement center. Good for her. She learned her lessons from using unauthorized representative. But yes, I'm curious now what happened with the it, settlement center. Yeah, when she went there, the lawyer of the center submitted an application for PR under the interim caregiver class. Oh, so the lawyer yeah. thought that, yeah, the lawyer thought that she's qualified, mm -hmm. right? Or apply for PR. Mm -hmm. That application resulted to her third refusal. So there were three different caregiver programs. She applied for PR and had three refusals, right? So that's why this, the, this yes. is a le lesson for everyone, you know, for the viewers, yeah. for those applying for PR. When you talk to somebody, make sure that they are either licensed or that they have really the knowledge. Yeah, right? they have the competency. So G, you just uh, highlighted a very important um, aspect here which is the competency, right? Because here we already have a lawyer who's supposed to be uh, knowledgeable about immigration law uh, and yet missed that, um, that piece of information, very crucial information that the caregiver cannot apply in the interim program because she was under the LICP program. So uh, it's very unfortunate that she did not, you know, heed your advice. So I, I guess 
I guess right now, what, uh, do, you, do you know what her status is right now? Well, actually, the last time I talked to her, she still has the valid status, the work well, permit I got yeah. for her. Yeah. yeah, but it will be expiring soon. Mm -hmm. I think wh what happened was um, she was in a rush to apply for PR because remember, she applied the second time under yeah. the Caring for Children class. She already mm -hmm. had the language test and also the ECA. And you know how expensive it is now to yes, take sure. the language test. Uh, I think mm -hmm. it's more than $300 already, yeah, right? Yeah. And yeah. the ECA is like $200, mm -hmm. $250, depending mm -hmm. on the institution or the organization you go to. Yeah. So what happened was she thought she would be qualified. And then she was rushing it because, mm -hmm. you know, so she could not spend another dime again for all these things, right? For yeah. the language, for the ECA. Yeah, she was trying. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, she was trying to... to um, apply before the validity of her, yeah, of her language test expires. Well, yeah, you cannot rush these things mm -hmm. because you have to follow the, the processes, right? Regulations. And um, I don't, so an interesting question would be, you know, uh, was, did she pay the lawyer? <laughs> I think she would. Uh, I, I think she with did. the settlement centers, they don't charge. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, but, but the then, thing is, yeah, but the yeah. thing is, you know, the time, the time yeah. spent on the file. And she said that the lawyer is appealing her case, but I don't know because um, she might have meant it as leave for judicial review because there's mm -hmm. no appeal for temporary residents. Yes. So maybe caregiver just, is not appealable, right? Yeah. So maybe she just didn't understand. Uh, yeah. what the lawyer was was telling her but so, they're doing something to it so that's why i don't want to get involved anymore because oh, yeah. there's already a lawyer that's handling the case right now right mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. regarding oh, her refusal absolutely so it it just highlights th this uh, case of yours it just highlights um the the need for competency in the practice not only for lawyers, but also for us, uh, for ICICs, right? And mm -hmm. also in, in this example that you gave us, which is, uh, guys, this, this is a true to life uh, example, very painful and, and, you know, a lot of time and money and effort spent. And in her future applications, she will have really a very difficult time because it will, she will have three uh, refusals for permanent uh, resident applications already, right? And so, she has to declare them in the forms. Yes. So that's a lot of uh, explanation. That's a lot of work. <laughs> yeah. And so, um, yeah, yeah, so her experience was more on the unauthorized representation. Yeah, because and, she got refused yeah, twice. And uh, you know, involvement of settlement centers. Yes, exactly. I admire what they do. I admire the, the the works of the settlement centers, but there are times when you should know your limit. Yeah, for sure. Clients, right? Yeah, they're, they're already helping uh, people in a lot of ways, you know, like with housing, uh, finding, helping uh, clients find jobs, right? Place, right. Uh, job placements, uh, housing and helping them even with, you know, um, securing their uh, health cards, the SIM cards, you know, the, the newcomers. So they're already doing a lot. So, I, but I guess, you know, when it comes to uh, immigration matters, it is best really to leave it with a competent uh, person, mm -hmm. right? Someone who, who knows, um, uh, how the the system works and who is always updated with with uh, what's happening with the policies so uh yeah so i i, I guess you still have another um example for oh, us yes um the second case that uh we will be discussing are for international students oh, okay there are a lot of them here that mm -hmm. came to came to canada 
as international students and studied in private schools. Unfortunately, most of them are not qualified for the post-graduation work permit, which mm-hmm. they did not know when they enrolled. It's yeah, because they were, of they the... Were not told. Yes, they were not told. Those are, those are information that were missed. Mm-hmm. Or they... Deliberately missed. Deliberately missed. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they were right. not told because, you know, these uh, education advisors or uh, educa- these agents, they really don't care as long as you enroll in, the, in their college, right? So, right. Yeah. So okay. So, yeah, t- so tell me what happened with with uh, this case. Tell the view. Okay. I yours. I just picked one. Yeah. I just picked one. Uh, actually, there were uh, at least two or three uh, international uh-huh. students with the same problem, but I just picked one that was um, she came uh, and studied in a private college, per advice uh-huh. of an education advisor and not a regulated international student immigration advisor mm-hmm. or RISHA. So for international students, check the people you're talking to. If they're not regulated Canadian immigration consultants, they could be regulated international student immigration advisor. Mm-hmm. They mm-hmm. work specifically to international students. Mm-hmm. So make sure they are RISHA or RCS. Yes. So actually, she was not the only international student, as I mentioned, that encountered this problem. So they Mm -hmm. were made to believe they could stay in Canada after their studies by enrolling in a private college. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the private colleges they studied did not qualify them to apply for post-graduation work permit after 2016. And so now they have to go back. So this particular student, want to take another year in a community college mm-hmm. so good for her because yeah. she took another course in a community college mm-hmm. others yeah others did not anymore because they don't have funds anymore mm-hmm. right so uh what we did what we did is we argued the matter with ircc when we applied for the post-graduation work permit and she mm-hmm. was granted a three-year work permit because during that time, when she studied at the private college, that private DLI or mm-hmm. designated learning institution uh, was still eligible for PGWP. And then they took it out 2016. Had she applied right away after graduation, she could have gotten one mm-hmm. year. So yeah, we argued so that with IRCC plus the eligibility with the community college. So she was able to get three years mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Work, work permit, post-graduation work permit. So that was a good thing. Yeah. So what, what about the others? Of course. That's so, yeah, so I, I know this case <laughs> that, that yes. you're talking about. And I remember that this uh, particular client, uh, she was um, telling us that... Uh, this education agent or advisor whom she dealt with just stopped taking her calls. Uh, She could not reach her anymore. Um, You know, she would set an appointment, but then this person would not show up. So it was very stressful for her and and, uh, she didn't know what to do. Uh, It was a good thing that you know, she met up with G or you referred her to me. <laughs> <laughs> yes. well, well, that, it, I think, I, you know, I think this is most likely the, the problems of international students that came to Canada yeah. and studied in private colleges because after graduation, when they're trying to stay in Canada and apply for post-graduation work permit, that's when they will know that yes. they are not eligible. So then mm-hmm. they start calling uh, this uh, whoever helped them, whether yeah. they're unauthorized or authorized or mm-hmm. education advisors. They could not reach them anymore. I yeah. think two other, two other students, and there's another one that we, we helped, 
that's mm-hmm. the same problem she had. She yeah. could not contact anymore the person that mm-hmm. helped them come to Canada, right? And, and I so, also learned about another case, G, that th- this mm-hmm. one, um, she, yeah, so she, she asked earlier, who are these unauthorized representatives? And G gave us very mm-hmm. good examples, real life examples. Uh, so now we just want to uh, show you uh, under the law, who are the authorized representatives? So uh, first, uh, it says a lawyer uh, who is a member in good standing of a law society of a province, province or a notary who is a member in good standing of the chamber in Quebec. So paralegal, they are also, um, you know, they are also authorized, but they, but they are limited in the practice uh, because they can only uh, represent clients before the IRB or Immigration Refugee Board. Uh, if they want to uh, represent a client or give advice to their client, give immigration advice to a client, they need to be registered with the ICCRC. They need to be regulated uh, uh, Canadian um, immigration consultants. So a student at law uh, does not contravene um, the, this section if he is offering advice, if he is under the supervision of a lawyer. So we have that. So we have lawyers, uh, RCIC, student of law, paralegals. The paralegal, of course, we have some limitations. And, um, and the fifth here is the RCIC's regulated Canadian immigration consultant. So these are the persons who are allowed to give um, immigration advice. And uh, so, uh, uh, G, will, will, can you um, share with them what are the consequences for, uh, what are the consequences for people who are, you know, found, uh, found to be giving immigration advice when they're not supposed to? Well, that... Um... Well, I, I, I still yet to see somebody <laughs> that was <true>. fined <laughs> and true. penalized, right? Yes. <laughs> okay, so yeah, well, according to law, it, every person who contravenes will be, it depends, or if there is a conviction or indictment, they will mm-hmm. be fined $200,000 an, or an imprisonment for a term of not more than two years. Or if it's a summary conviction to a fine of not more than 40000 or an imprisonment for a term of not more than six months or to both. But as you see, as you see that um, I have yet to see somebody who did something like this or committed such an offense yeah. to really be pe- Okay, so by the way, G, I, I, I want to ask your opinion about uh, this uh, uh, statement of Immigration Minister Marco Mendocino last um, December 2020 during the General Assembly of um, RCIC. So uh, Mendocino said that the Philippines is among the top three countries where um, unauthorized immigration consultants or what we call the ghost ghost consultants proliferate. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so I, I want to just get your your opinion about this. Okay, that well, actually it's a fact, right? Um, I could I could attest to that because I have at least two um, clients. Uh, who mm-hmm. were 
who paid these um, agencies there in the Philippines. And uh, they're even charging debt huh, from, from, let's say, an application for, uh, let's say, express entry, federal skilled worker, or in, as international students. Mm -hmm. When they charge the clients, they charge until permanent residency. So imagine oh, how much yeah. money they charge the clients mm -hmm. because should... they had to pay for the current application, let's say the federal skilled worker and, or international students. They already paid the post-graduation work permit and they also paid already the PR. It's so unfortunate mm -hmm. and sad that you know it is yeah yeah it is existing there in the philippines the and another problem there is they are not regulated there in the philippines we are regulated here and they can the, like the cbsa can run after ghost consultants here in canada mm -hmm. what about those outside and yeah. it's so sad and unfortunate that the philippines is named as one of the top three countries in the world yes. for that, right? It, 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 it is a free for all in the Philippines when it comes to these unauthorized representatives because, you know, the, the, the law, <laughs> the long arm of the law isn't long enough to, re <laughs> to reach them. So that, that's um, what's so sad with this because a lot of people like just, you know, um, gather up all the resources and some even pawn uh, property just right, so they can right. have money to, you know, to, to finance their, their immigration application. And, right. and this exorbitant fees being charged by this um, unauthorized representatives, as you already mentioned, would include fees for their PR application when, for example, it's still a long process before they get to that point from entering Canada as a student. Right. Especially if they put the student in a private college. Right. So, <laughs> and they so, are not eligible for post-graduation work yes, permit. Yes, exactly. So, and, and I asked these clients, right, uh, why don't you request for a refund? And, you know, the answer is they don't refund. So if you're not able to use up the money that you already paid, they're saying, if you have a family member that wants to come to Canada too, we will process their application for free. So they will not refund the money. Free. Yeah, they will put it to another application, which is ridiculous because these it are is. the people's, yeah, they, these are hard earned money of these people, yeah. right? And, and some, then just like what you said, some have pawned their properties. Yes, properties or, or maybe working animals. Yes. Right? Right. <laughs> they, would, they would pawn the, you know, the carabao. How much does the carabao uh, right. sell right now? They, they would pawn their working animals, their land, and whatever, just to come up with, with the funds needed to have, you know, their, for example, their proof of funds to become a student here or the proof of funds to be eligible to come here as a federal skilled worker. Right. So, yeah, so it, it's really very uh, sad, the, the plight of, you know, Filipino people and, and of course, other, other uh, nationalities too, who become victims of um, unauthorized representatives. And yeah, that's why that's why we are encouraging them to really check on the people you talk yes. to. Be vigilant. Yes. Your, your due diligence. Right. right? And um, especially because these agencies, uh, not only in the Philippines, but also, you know, like countries like Dubai, uh, India, yes, Dubai to India, yeah, China, you mm -hmm. know, these agencies would have a legal presence in the countries where they are operating. So right. they are legally, uh, you know, they can operate legally in the Philippines. They can operate legally in Dubai and they are paying business permit. They're paying their taxes, right. but they are not allowed to give 
immigration advice when it comes to um, Canada's uh, immigration laws for, you know, they're not allowed to give advice for a fee. So it's really, it's really muddled <laughs> this issue. I know, right? I know. It is very sad because, you know, these people are just dreaming of a better life. They dream mm. to come to Canada thinking that, you know, Canada is the best place to live in. That Canada is the best education for their children. Yeah. And yeah. they meet these unauthorized representatives who just took their money. And that's it. You know, it's a good thing for one because they were able to come to Canada. The other one had a problem because they were not able to come to Canada well they they had to spend a separate money and went for another consultant just to come to Canada but they were not able to get the refund from that money they paid for the for that agency so it's it's very sad yeah and that's you know blood sweat and tears right right it's hard earned money and you know you don't just uh, go out in the streets and and you know, see that yeah. money yeah. lying around, pick it up. <laughs> or, or you don't have a money tree at home where right. you can just pluck the dollars off the, the tree, right? So, yes, and it's, it's good right now that um, there are steps being right. done to, you know, to, to really... Um, um run after this uh, yes run after fraudulent the, agencies right yeah especially with the uh, with the transition of mm -hmm. our iccrc into a college uh which now the 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 college can now run after also these unauthorized representatives whereas before they they're only um they're only responsible for regulating us authorized right. consultants now they can run after unauthorized consultants but everything is a slow moving process i know i know it's still a long <laughs> way it's still a long yeah. way yeah I, I have yet to see the first step yeah same same here yeah. so we are hopeful but at the I same see. time you know we have to be realistic that right. this is not going to happen tomorrow Right. Right. So, so it's uh, it's up to the people, right? Yeah. To check, you know. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Check the people you talk to. Check them if they are authorized. Check them if they are able to refund your money in mm -hmm. in times when they're not able to help you, or if nothing has been done to your cases. Yeah. Yeah. So make check. sure. Check for Make sure you have a retainer's agreement. Yes, exactly. Which is about... valid. Which is valid retainer's agreement. Yes. That's the very importance of a retainer's agreement. Yes, I was about to, to mention that. That it's really important to have a retainer's agreement where uh, it says what your responsibilities are as a client and what are the responsibilities of your consultant to you. Right. And there, mm -hmm. is there a process for refund? You know, it, it should be all stated in that agreement and the agreement should be signed by both parties, because I've seen an agreement where only the client was supposed to sign. <laughs> what kind of agreement is that? <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, so so those are the red flags. If someone contacts you and, and doesn't give you a retainer agreement, or ask for payment in cash, then you know run away as fast as you can, because mm -hmm. for sure that that's that's uh, bogus. That's not legitimate. Yeah. So I guess G, thank you for <laughs> for this first episode of our dear immigration consultant. Um, we will try to do this as regular as we can, you know, yes. because we're both busy with clients, <laughs> right. but uh, this is part of our public service. Right. Uh, this is part of, you know, educating also people and also mm -hmm. like part of, um, it, it can serve also as like a, a, a free um, legal clinic, right? Right. For, for oh. immigration law. 
Right. Um, if uh, I, I want to advertise as well that uh, mm -hmm. uh, for those who are in need of help and, you know, they don't have the resources uh, to pay for services, they can also, other than our avenue here, uh, yeah. there's also another nonprofit organization where I'm also a, a part of the free legal clinic there. You know, the Agent Court uh, Community Services Association. So they can okay. go there. They can ask for help. There are also lawyers there for family matters. Uh, for uh, criminal lawyers will be there as well. Uh, so we have scheduled and, and also immigration matters. Okay, perfect. So, so yes, yeah, so... Uh, thank you, uh, Zerlin, for also alerting our viewers um, on the services of um, Asian Court or AXA, right? AXA, AXA, that's, that's yeah. the Asian Court Community Services yeah, so, Association. Yeah, yeah so, that, so it's very, you know, it's very good that these services are accessible to people as well. Um, mm -hmm. Because, yeah, because that's what we, we, we need. Right in our society these days, like accessibility <laughs> yes. to services. So, uh, yes. Yeah, so, uh, I think we're going to wrap this up. Right. And uh, again, if if you know in the future you have some immigration concerns, mm -hmm. uh, please do uh, write to us. Uh, I will post in the description box the email where you can send your your um, inquiries or your immigration concerns. Uh, this is, again, the segment of um, Straight Talk Immigration, and it's called Dear Immigration Consultant. And thank you for joining us today. Uh, thank you my, uh, to my colleague and my mentor, Geraldine Alcalde. And um, yes, I'll see You're you again soon. And happy yes, Looking day. forward. <laughs> yes, looking forward to talk to you guys again. Okay. Happy family day. Bye. Bye.